worship the Lord together? We waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth.
his strength and his power and his glory that all comes upon us when we gather. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And I'm, I am feeling like I'm not in a tin can today. It is so nice. So if I shake your hand, uh, you'll know that I'm feeling better. No more elbow pumps, okay? All right. A couple things real quickly that we want you to be aware of. That this month is our alabaster month. So we have these little boxes out at the the information center, if you want to take one home, we'll be collecting these boxes to give to the Church of the Nazarene to help build uh, different kinds of buildings around the world, primarily in third world countries. So we'll collect this at the end of February. You have a couple more weeks before we'll bring this in as an offering. This Wednesday night, we will have our normal uh, meal at 5.30, 5.30, 5.45. You can come and have a meal before the service, but we're going to have an all-church worship experience this Wednesday night as we begin a journey toward Easter Sunday. 
This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we're going to have an evening of preparing our hearts for a journey into our Lenten season. So 645, we'll have our worship service in the sanctuary together. That's children, teens, and adults. We'll, in fact, we'll have no uh, extra services going on, no ESL. Uh, it's possible that the, the Spanish church that... Uh, that uses our facility might be having their Bible study, but 645 for our Ash Wednesday service. Ushers, would you come, please? We'd love to receive our tithe and our offerings today. Let's just take a moment and give thanks. Lord, you have taken such wonderful care of us, and we thank you, Jesus, for the ways in which you work in our lives. We thank you, Father, that uh, you know exactly how we are comprised, how we are made up as a body here at Westside. And um, we believe, Lord Jesus, that every need will be met as you speak through the hearts of your children to bring into your hands our gifts today. May you multiply Jesus' ministry all around this community through the faithfulness of your people. May you give us an opportunity, Jesus, to be a blessing around the world. Uh, through different kinds of offerings that we bring. We're just grateful, Lord, for the privilege that we have to bring into your hands these gifts today, knowing full well that you'll take care of the needs as well as flinging open the windows of heaven and pouring down into our own individual lives for our needs as well. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. An invitation to trace the pattern stars And early in July a celebration For freedom that is ours And I notice you in children's games In those who watch them from the shade Every drop of sun is full of fun and wonder. You are summer. And even when the trees have just surrendered, So it will be as 
testify yes he walks with me every season of my life his fingerprints are all over all over the place amen thank you for reminding us of that today Taryn
true for anyone today? Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I As we look to the Lord in prayer this morning, maybe some would like to come and just bow down at the altar to just acknowledge you are my defense, Lord. You can shield around me today and protect me. You're my righteousness, Jesus. You're what makes my life right. And you just want to praise him this morning. Is there any that would like to come and kneel at these altars? If you would, make your way down. And Pastor Isaac will lead us in prayer. God, that is our confession today. Reminded of the story where some friends brought the paralyzed man to you, Jesus. Other people could have helped. Could have helped him have money or a place to live. But no one, no one could save that man. So they brought him to you, Jesus. Because you can actually do something about the brokenness that he was in. That's us, God. We lay at your feet. We say we know you are the only one who can save us. 
You're the only one who can help us through the brokenness that we sometimes find ourselves in. So we lay at your feet. We thank you, God, that you teach us through your word that you are with us. Jesus, you said that you would be with us now and always. And so thank you, God, for walking each moment with us. Thank you for sending your spirit to comfort us, to strengthen us. Thank you for the ways that you reveal yourself to us through each other. Through the ways that we are able to wrap our arms around each other. Speak your truth. You have given us you through each other and through your spirit. So thank you, God. Help us in the midst of our whatever it is we face to recognize that you are there. Sometimes it's hard to realize that you're there. So would you, in your great mercy, in your great love, remind us of your presence. We are so grateful, God, that you walk with us. We're so grateful that you heal. We praise you and thank you for the good report that we heard from our sister Jan this week. God, you are God. You are the creator, and you have named that this week, and so we praise you. We pray you would continue to be healing, that you would continue to work among us, your people. There are so many who are dealing with, with illnesses, diseases, broken bodies, and so healer, would you continue to work? Would you continue to create anew in your people? And we are quick to praise you for that. Now we turn our attention to the ways that you are creating anew our minds, our hearts, our lives. You're doing that through your word and through your servant, Pastor Dave. And so we pray that we will be people who are listening listening with everything we've got so that we might do as you've called us to do, Jesus, to love you with everything we've got and to love our neighbors. So we give this time to you, anticipating the ways that you will shape us and create us anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise his name. I want to extend thanks to uh, Greg and Ann's uh, Sunday school class because they healed me last Sunday night. A little bit of white apple uh, cider mixed with honey. If you saw a video of me taking a shot glass, it was that. <laughs> All right. Um, that, that helped a little bit, but I think I've become addicted to the peppermint essential oils. So there you go, Devon. You might have a new person to supply peppermint oil to. My wife uh, probably is getting tired of the smell, but who really cares? <laughs> it makes me better. All right. Good news. Monday, uh, we had a couple babies born to families in our church. Uh, the major's daughter, Beth, gave birth to a little girl on Monday. We're thankful for that. And uh, Randy Secor, uh, you and Judy, your, your son, William, and your daughter-in-law, Callie, gave birth to a little girl. Praise the Lord, both on Monday, how exciting, they're a week old, are they reading yet? I'm sure they're brilliant children. We are grateful that the Lord is working in beautiful ways around our church and and blessing us and bringing us uh, his favor and his power and his anointing week after week. We're studying uh, the parables of the uh, gospel of Luke, so if you want to turn to Luke chapter 14 today verses 1 through 14. We're going to be in Luke 14 today and again next Sunday because the chapter is just too full of miracles, teaching, intrigue, 
And uh, two different parables are in this 14th chapter. And the, the people of that particular uh, audience, and we're going to talk about them here in just a moment, they received a blessing at this one meal that they were all at. Jesus gave them two stories to think about and to consider. And so let's, let's dive in this morning to Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisee and the experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and then sent him on his way. Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked their places of honor at the table, he began to tell them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both, both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted. <laughs> exalted. They might be exhausted too. But for sure they'll be exalted. <laughs> It's, it's hard work being humble. The song said so. It's so hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> then Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. As we dive into this parable, this teaching time today, Jesus has been invited to lunch after church. Uh, and it's, it's a big deal to be invited to the Pharisee, this prominent Pharisee's house. Uh, this is not an open luncheon, uh, not just for anybody to come. It's by invitation only. And Jesus was on the list. I think we know why Jesus is invited to the prominent Pharisee's house. The scripture tells us that they had their eyes on him. They were watching him carefully. Every move that he makes Everything that he says, they want to record and think and put into their plan to get rid of him. So they're watching Jesus carefully. The religious leaders are always watching Jesus and looking for opportunities to discredit him. As we examine this morning this, this guest list, we have some interesting things that come to, come to mind. Not only is Jesus an invited guest in this prominent Pharisee's house, but you notice that this sick man has been invited to this meal. I don't think it's by chance that the sick man has been invited. This, is, this man has been invited and positioned where he's been positioned right in front of Jesus to see how Jesus will respond to the man who has a need. I mean, straight in front of Jesus, 
Right in front of him, this man who has been suffering from abnormal swelling for years. I don't know exactly what he's suffering for, but the word indicates in the original language, and it might, and remember, Luke is the physician. He understands some of those medical terms that doctors throw out at you once in a while. It's very possible that this man is suffering from something like edema. A, a, an abnormal swelling that causes, that, that becomes so large sometimes that it, that it actually bursts forth from the skin and, and requires serious care and takes a long time often to heal from. This man's been suffering this for a long time. And it's not an accident that he's right in front of Jesus. Jesus has violated the Sabbath before. By healing. Five, seven times in the Gospels you see where Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And every time the same response comes from the religious leaders. How dare you do that on this day? All the eyes were on Jesus. So you have Jesus the invited guest of this prominent Pharisee and the religious leaders. You have this sick man brought intentionally to be in front of Jesus, to test Jesus. You have the Pharisees and the experts in the law on the guest list. And it's to these men that Jesus asks a very simple question. Verse 3, he says to them, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And their response was overwhelming. They said nothing to that question. Jesus was a master at involving people to give their own answers. Well, what do you say? How do you see it? Is it lawful or not to heal this man on the Sabbath day? Nobody cared to answer, even though he gave them an opportunity. Very wise a very wise action of Jesus to give them the opportunity to answer themselves. And since no one responded, Jesus reaches down in verse 4, takes a hold of the man, heals him, and then don't miss what he does next. He reaches down and he heals the man, and then he sends him on his way. This man does not need to see what's about to take place. This man has just been healed by the power of Almighty God. Jesus has reached out and met his need. And for the first time in who knows how many years, he's, he's feeling normal. He's not in pain. His body's not racked with pain and suffering. And Jesus wants to protect him from what's about to take place. Because you realize a man was invited there only to trap Jesus, not because they cared about him. So Jesus sends him on his way. I sense two polar opposite responses from the guests in the house that day by Jesus' healing. First of all, I see the sick man who's been suffering filled with elation, don't you? I mean, I, I, doubt, very ser I, I doubt seriously that he just said, oh, thank you very much. I was hoping that maybe something like this would happen. Thank you. I believe welling up within him was an elation that could not be contained. I believe that he got excited that his body was touched and healed. I don't believe he cared a lick what day of the week it was. Do you? By the way, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> and what Jesus does, do we really have any right whatsoever to question? <laughs> this man was elated and healed. What plagued him was gone. But the religious leaders were in shock and disgust. Well, we don't have recorded in this story any, any mumblings of protest. But what seems obvious to me by their silence and by Jesus' following question 
and the example of what makes the healing proper in verse 5, the religious leaders were not happy. Look at verse 5 again. Jesus says to them when they remain silent, He says, I, I have a question. If one of you has a child or, or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not reach down and pull it out? Will you not meet the need of your child? And again, they were chatterboxes. They had nothing to say to Jesus. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked their places of honor, he begins to tell them a story. And just before he tells them the story. Let me, let me share with you something that William Barclay has to say about this particular day because the hope is that some of them were enlightened by the healing of a suffering man on the Sabbath and how that might hold a place of importance more than religious practice. But here's what William Barclay says in his commentary on Luke. He says, on this occasion, quote, on this occasion, a Pharisee invited Jesus to a meal on the Sabbath. The law had its meticulous and detailed regulations about Sabbath meals. Of course, no food could be cooked on the Sabbath. That would be considered work. All food had to be cooked on Friday, and if it was necessary to keep it hot, it must be kept hot in such a way that it was not cooked any longer on the Sabbath. So it is laid down, and this is interesting, it is laid down that food to be kept warm for the Sabbath must not be put into oil dregs or manure or salt or chalk or sand. I'm kind of for that. <laughs> Just saying. That's some interesting regulations there. Don't keep your food warm in the manure pile. Just saying. Okay, I'm not making this stuff up. It may be, however, put into clothing amidst fruits, pigeons' feathers, and flax toe. <laughs> it was the observance, hear me, it was the observance of regulations like that that the Pharisees and scribes regarded as religion. No wonder they could not understand Jesus. No wonder they struggled so hard to understand Jesus in his teaching. They were so into religious ritual that they missed right in front of their faces the need of a suffering man. This story is all about doing the right thing. Our call in life is not to be religious, it's to be righteous. Right living, and right living will at times fly in the face of religion and religious organizations. Not only was Jesus being watched by the religious leaders, Jesus was watching them too. Verse 7. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked their places of honor at the table, he took this opportunity to tell them this parable when Jesus noticed this mad scramble to be seated at the places of honor, he took the opportunity to talk a little bit about being humble. Jesus couldn't pass up the opportunity to teach, and we have the first of two parables that he shares at this dinner. The first one I read again. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. And if so, the host who invited both of you will come to you and say, give that person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take a lower place or the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do you remember how 
Do you wonder how that parable played in that place where everyone there, or most, most of the people there who had been gathered were, were so used to their places of honor? They, they loved to be recognized by people. Jesus talks in the Sermon and Sermon on the Mount about how they used to love to pray in, in front of everybody so that they would be noticed for their, their religious activity. They loved to walk into the banquet with their beautiful flowing purple, the sign of royalty, the sign of their position. They used to love to walk and come and sit at the table of honor. To be honored by the people. Jesus says, when that's your focus, you've already received your reward. It's a hollow reward. It's not a lasting thing to receive accolades and praise and some sense of adulation from the people. That's a pretty, pretty hollow reward. But he says they've already received their reward because of their own exalted understanding of their place of importance. So this mad scramble is taking place to get at the place of honor, to get at the best seat. How many of you have ever been, I probably, this is such a poor analogy, but how many of you have ever been to a Royals game in really cheap seats? How many of you say, that's all I can afford? Well, kind of, bless you. Only go once or twice a year, and then maybe you can really spring. But if you like to go as often as I do, you, you kind of get used to buying the cheaper seats. Not the nosebleed seats, but the cheaper places around the stadium. And every once in a while, I've gone in there hoping, hoping that I would be the upgraded fan today. <laughs> Any of you ever wanted to be the upgraded fan? And to set in some of those honorable seats. Uh, Lisa Richards used to work at Pepsi, and she'd call me up and she'd go, I've got some seats. You're, they're killer seats. Do you want them? And they were in the crown section right behind home plate. And my response to her always was, no, I don't want those seats. Give me the cheap stuff. No, yes, I want them. Absolutely, how cool it is to be upgraded. How cool will it be to learn how to humble ourselves before the Lord Jesus Christ only for him to come into the room and say, friend, let me give you a better place. I, I watch a lot of Royals baseball and every time I do, they're sitting in the Buck O'Neill legacy seat as our former district superintendent, Jaron Rowell. And I wonder, how did he get that gig? I wonder if they'll change it this year. I hope not. I love to see Jaron sitting there. Wondering if he'll ever invite me to be his guest. Hoping. Friend, I've got a better seat for you. And because you've learned the importance of humbling yourself, sacrificing your own for the kingdom of God, I've got something for you that is beyond your wildest dream. This teaching of Jesus, I doubt if it played really well with the befuddled religious leaders. Getting the right seat of honor, according to Jesus, is exalting uh, myself. And, and the end result is self-exaltation. Self He's saying to them, if you lift yourself up, you've, you've received your reward. And then Jesus, after he teaches this parable about humbling ourselves so that Jesus can then exalt us to the position he has in mind, he turns his attention to the host and he says to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors if you do, they're going to invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. 
although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Wow. The poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the man suffering from abnormal swelling. That's who should be invited to the table as your guest. I wonder if, these, if this prominent Pharisee, the host of this big time meal, really understood Jesus' complete message. The host had invited the sick man only to trap Jesus, to observe if Jesus would again violate the Sabbath and heal. The prominent Pharisee had no concern for the sick man and would never have invited him to the meal if there were not a reason The sick man had nothing valuable to offer the religious leaders. But it is wrong to invite only those who have the ability to re, re, uh, reciprocate. It's wrong to only do something for someone who can do something back for you. That's, that's the message Jesus gives to the host. It is absolutely right to do something for people who cannot repay you whatsoever. It's right to reach out and to compassionately touch the lives of people who are struggling, whatever they're struggling with, to just reach out and touch them, knowing full well that they're never going to be able to add anything to you materially. I, I think that they do add a lot to us personally. When we reach out and help the needs of people around us who have nothing to give back to us, I think it does help us because I think Jesus then begins to teach us what it means to receive the reward of his blessing. And, and really, what Jesus is saying to this host that day, hoping, hoping that he's listening, Jesus is saying, you know, if you do the right thing, you will be repaid. There's coming a day when all those who are in my father's family will come to the table and there's going to be a reciprocated kind of blessing that comes out to us directly from the father at the resurrection of the righteous. It's all about focus and intent and, and thinking about really what it is that is important in life. I always know when a sermon is hitting home for me. I don't always know when it's hitting home for you, but I know when it's hitting home for me. When I'm in my study and I'm working my way through what the Lord wants me to say and, and what ends up at the very end is this conclusion that is not quite as clear as I want it to be. I always know that the Lord's hitting the nail on the head for me when I haven't figured out yet how it is He wants me to end something. And then I know that the Lord is really dealing with my heart when what emerges from my time of study in the Word and my time of writing a sermon is nothing but a whole list of questions. Questions that come from the Word of God. Questions that come from the Holy Spirit's dealing with my heart. Questions that I hope come to you as I'm preaching. A checklist, kind of, of thoughts about what it means to do the right thing. I had five thoughts come to my mind. The good news is I'm just going to read them. I'm not going to expand on them. Somebody say Amen. Thank you. The first question I have is, am I missing the needs right in front of me because I'm focused on something else? The second question that came to my mind was, are you checking your motives, David? Am I doing stuff for people who can do stuff for me? third question that came to my mind is what are people seeing us do if they are watching us fourth question do I easily defer prestigious position and the power that accompanies that 
position? Do I easily defer to less power? Number five, does my or our ministry reflect a heavenly perspective? Are we more concerned about our, our righteousness, our relationship with Jesus, than we are on a relig religious exercise? Those are the questions that came to me as I listened to Jesus teach those people 2,000 years ago. My hope and my prayer this day is that Jesus will keep speaking to us and our eyes will be opened and our ears unstopped and that we will receive what he has. Our Father, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your presence in this room. We know, Lord, that you are truly as here today as you were at that prominent Pharisee's house 2,000 years ago. And kind of the difference in my perspective today, Jesus, is we've been invited to be at your place today. You have brought us, Jesus, into this place of worship to speak to our hearts. My hope, oh Lord, today is that you'll keep speaking to my heart, to my friends' hearts. And that the glory of God would be exalted in this place. And the righteousness of doing the right thing, Lord, would be in the following through of what you ask us to do. And that, Jesus, our prayer would be equally as fervent this day for every church of the Nazarene every church of Jesus Christ in this city, in this state, in this nation, in this world, that Jesus Christ and your righteousness would rule the day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Isaac, share a benediction with you. Well, may our King Jesus continue to shape your mind, your heart, and your life. And as he does that, may he continue to bless you and to keep you and to make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.